Good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm really happy to tell you about my guest, Aditya Bhutani. Did I pronounce that right? Aditya Bhutani? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But I'll call you Addy, right? Is that okay? Yep. That's what I yeah. go with. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm really happy to have Addy here this morning, and she'll be talking about accessibility and neurodiversity. And we're going to be talking about um, the workplace and how neurodiversity, people who are neurodivergent can um, get along well in the workplace. So I'm going to do a brief introduction. Aditya is CEO of AEL Data, where he helps companies federally funded and private meet Section 508 com compliance to help them secure government contracts. Section 508 is a U.S. federal law that requires federal agencies to make information and communications technology accessible to people with disabilities. He's also an entrepreneur who created an accessibility tool called LERA, L-E-R-A, an accessibility checker for websites. Ali also talks about the challenges of living with ADHD a neurodiverse condition that affects concentration and behavior. Please help me welcome Addy to my show. How are you today, Addy? I'm doing awesome. Thank you so much for having me on your show. <laughs> I'm glad to have you. So um, I wanted to talk about how you ended up working in the accessibility field and how, and how it happened. Because I know yeah. in the beginning, you're working in IT, am I right? Yeah. 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 Well, it wasn't completely IT. Um, I graduated in 2008 when, you know, the Lehman Brothers crisis, and I was an accountant with specialization in mortgage banking. Obviously, nobody was going to hire me back then. So that's when I started working <laughs> in tech. And 2010 was pretty much when I got my first job. Uh, it was in digital publishing, but I worked as like a, a business analyst where I would take like requirements from, you know, the customers and the business team and then translate it over to the technical teams. That's where I started getting a little bit more exposure to the services that we were providing. And uh, we would convert uh, text to speech and provide that as an MP3 uh, or some sort of form of an audio book. But the only caveat there was the input material was encoded in XML. So these were known as Daisy talking books. And the end clients were blind users or people with vision impairments who would borrow the books from their libraries. And I'm not really sure how they distributed them out, but we contracted to like libraries and stuff making these uh, audio books, right? And I worked in this department for about two and a half years, even before I realized I was working in document accessibility or accessibility of some, some sort. So it was kind of by accident, if you ask me. Wow. It's worked out well for you, though, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was super interesting. Um, so documents, you know, from doing the MP3s and they were called Daisy Talking Books. And I started working with uh, PDFs. Uh, mainly the production and QA of making remediating PDFs. And it wasn't until 2018 that I started web accessibility. And that was, that coincided with my adult diagnosis of ADHD and dyslexia. Okay. So that leads us to um, um, your ADHD. So that's pretty recently that you found out you had ADHD when you were diagnosed in 2018? Yeah. 2019? 18. About, yeah. Yeah. So what so was your initial reaction and how has your life changed since being diagnosed? You know, um, in, in my case, like I thought it was, it was depression. That's kind of when I went to seek help and therapy and then underlying questions led to the therapist, uh, you know, suspecting that I had ADHD. And then they sent me in for uh, a whole cognitive evaluation, right? And there it turned out that I had ADHD with mild dyslexia, which isn't uncommon because comorbidities usually exist with, um, with ADHD. Um, 
sorry, I forgot your question. What was that? <laughs> Could you repeat your question? Oh, it was just I just asked about the initial reaction yeah. upon finding out about your diagnosis and yeah. how your life changed. Yeah. Sure. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, oh no, no problem. No problem. First thing is, you know, after the diagnosis, the first stage, as I like to call it, is acceptance. It's you know, it involves how you react post diagnosis to pretty much like work through those feelings. And you may want to fight those feelings. And I kind of did, or even fight the therapist, you know, to slide back into denial. But that was that was that was one of the most important stages right after the diagnosis, right? Uh, it took me a couple more sessions to sort of understand really why I thought the way I did and why my behavior was affected by ADHD. And uh, once that happened, it was the validation stage where I had immense relief and validation after I accepted the diagnosis. But it was so much more than that once I actually realized what it was. It was an official label, yes, but I actually knew why I behaved the way I did you know, throughout my life. And that in itself was a big uh, revelation. So now that I know, I actively work on things that I can control and try not to repeat them. Yeah, I know that one thing is that um, I've mentioned before is that sometimes it takes you longer to do some things because you focus. How do you manage to? I know that one of the traits of ADHD is hyper focus, right? So does that come easily to you or? Or is it more easily distracted? It, it's both. It really depends on the situation. Because when I find something that I'm like super interested in, that's where the hyper, hyper focus sort of like comes in, right? And it goes hand in hand with distraction. So I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm testing something on a website with a screen reader and something doesn't work as expected then I'm really interested in the testing bit because it's new. It's something new every day and it keeps me on my toes. Um, for With ADHD, you know, most people hate routine work. So that's why I like the testing part of it the most. Um, so if I run into a problem, I'm then deep diving into figuring out, was it a problem with my screen reader? Was it an operating system problem? Or is it a WCAG like failure that I'm not testing properly? And that is that hyper-focus that happens. And before you know, it's three hours have gone by and I'm, I'm trying to really like dig deep. So that helps, you know, when <laughs> it comes to work. But when I'm not doing work stuff and I get distracted, it's a problem because you need to really keep yourself mm -hmm. on track and not waste that time. So it's, it's a blessing and a curse, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. I wish I had that hyper focus. I don't have that when I'm working. I have to be very focused. I have to use a timer. And then my dogs are always interrupting me. I can't see my door is closed right now. See, but when I'm working, it's always open. So they come in and out, they bark at me. And it's like, I can't say no to my babies, you know, <laughs> really hard for me. But yeah, yeah so okay. hyper focus would be great. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like yeah, so it sounds like you went through all the stages, um, denial and then validation. So right, would it be safe to say that now you fully accepted it and you've learned to live with it, the ADHD? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I'm not medicated by choice. I was, but because of the side effects, you know, I prefer to plan my life around structure and habitual progression to sort of like mimic the same dopamine release that I would get from being medicated, right? Uh, yes, to answer your question, I have found coping mechanisms to sort of like live with it. Well, that's great. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, I know that medication helps some people. My nephew had ADHD also, as he was on medication, but I think it didn't really work well for him, um, but they didn't pursue any other 
um, avenues to help him. So I don't know if he's still on it, but. I mean, med medication I is, is about um, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's... Medication can have a lot of side effects, and that's something that we have to consider. Yeah, so it doesn't not, work for everybody. Yeah, I'm not opposed to it. It's just that it every yeah. different person reacts differently, and you have to really work with a good doctor to work with you to prescribe the right dosage, and. Um, yeah, I think I think that's that's probably the most critical thing. I I won't say it's a uh, a magic pill. It's not going to get you to a neurotypical state, but it will at least reduce your effects where you can try and keep up. Yeah. In the normal world. Yeah. So that's what I would say. Yeah. So so as someone who's living with ADHD, how do you? find that in impacts the work you do, you kind of cover this with hyperfocus, but maybe in other ways, how does it impact your work? And maybe getting along with the colleagues, people that you work with? Yes, so the first thing that I do at work when I onboard someone or I'm interacting with new hires, I tell them, hey, I have this medical condition and these are, the accommodations I need from them kind of thing, right? Like I'm like, I need written instructions for anything, everything through email. I don't answer too well to slacks or other IMs because email is the one thing that I, I don't know why it's just something I always work well with. Um, I need deadlines for everything. So I make sure that I, whenever somebody's new joins us, I'm like, these are the things that I need for you to get the most out of, out of me. Um, and once I set that down, I think it, it becomes really easy for everybody to work together, just being transparent, you know? I, I understand it may not be that easy for everybody else because they may not be self-employed, but I'd say like being transparent and honest is, you know, about, about your needs, working needs is very important. Um, so in terms of communication, that's one thing, but as an entrepreneur, I would say, ADHD is just a massive advantage. Uh, there are a lot of positive traits as well, right? Like, so I find that I'm able to improvise a lot and I move with a sense of urgency, uh, which can be a curse as well, but I try to use that and turn it into a positive where we move fast. I mean, it's in, we're almost in 23. And if you don't move fast, you're sort of, you become a dinosaur. Uh, so I use that to my advantage there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I find the things that you mentioned, I think can work in any other work setting also deadlines, straight open communication, open communication. So, um, those are things that make for an effective, healthy workplace, I think. So. Uh, we have yeah. some people joining us this morning. I just want to say hello to Krista, says hi, Juana. And then somebody said LinkedIn user. If you can tell us um, who you are, you have to go into your privacy settings on LinkedIn to make yourself public. So if you don't want me to call you LinkedIn user, so I prefer to call you by your name. So. <laughs> So this, another LinkedIn user, probably the same one. I just bought a planner for my ADHC. The structure is critical. Do you have a planner? Do you use a planner? I think everybody uses a planner. I use one. So, so my calendar is my planner. Uh, yeah. Hi, Krista. Yes, Krista. I've, I've seen her commenting on your post all the time. Yeah. She's got a podcast too, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, hi, she does. <laughs> it's a business podcast. Yes. Um, talks about marketing, mindset, how to get clients. She's really good. I do have to. Well, I have to, I have to make a confession. She's my coach. So, okay. So I okay. am biased. But she's only <laughs> my coach because I kind of vetted her for a while, I guess. I didn't vet her, but I was talking to her for a while. So she's All right. um, cool. 
She's the real thing. So I do recommend her if you ever want coaching, anybody who's listening, if you ever want business coaching, she is one to get in touch with. So about planners, um, do you have yeah. a plan? Does it help you with your ADHD? Yeah, so my calendar is my planner. Um, what I do is I get all my different calendars into one Google Calendar because I use an Android phone and just make sure everything syncs up. If I don't see something on there, it's not getting done. So I have um, events, appointments, um, reminders, like bill payments, everything goes in there. I know some people talk about automating your financial you know, expenses and stuff like that, but I really don't like that because yeah. I don't have, as an entrepreneur, sometimes you don't have a steady income stream. So I like to make sure I look at my bank account and then pay the bills out. But uh, to answer your question, a calendar is what I use as a planner. Super helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I can see why that would be super helpful. So let's see. So Krista says, this is really interesting. Yeah, I find the more we talk about um, neurodiversity in general and ADHD, but to me, it seems like it's coming up a lot. It's becoming something that many people are diagnosed with. And hopefully that's going to bring a lot more education about ADHD. So that's, that will help. Um, why am I so nervous? <laughs> that's all right. I am, okay. The Better Connect Academy is here. Do you know who they are? The Better no, Connect Academy. But hi, John. <laughs> Thank you for joining, John. Hello. Thank you for being here. And the LinkedIn user is Stephanie. Stephanie. Okay. This is Stephanie. My ADHD is a superpower, but all superheroes have cooked tonight. <laughs> So um, this brings up another yeah. interesting thing. Um, there's a woman on LinkedIn. I mentioned her to you yesterday, Katie, who has mm -hmm. a podcast called thewingycast.com. That's a funny name. But um, she has ADHD herself, but she really um, doesn't like that it's called a superpower. So how do you feel about some people calling it a superpower and other people don't agree with that. What is your take on that? Yeah, um, I know you sent it to me, but as someone with ADHD, I've procrastinated and not looked at it. So I apologize for that. But <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> no, no, no problem. <laughs> this is a, a great, great question. And I see Stephanie with a lot of comments. And yeah, I agree with you. Every superpower has its own kryptonite, right? And I have mixed reviews on this. Um, what was my kryptonite growing up became my superpower today, not because of meds or anything, but it's because it came with the self-awareness that I have after the diagnosis and the environment I created that allows me to use that superpower, if that's what you want to call it. Um, I, I understand why people refer to it as a superpower, but it's such a small part of the condition. Like ADHD has, it's a spectrum, just like, just like the autism spectrum, right? You have different mm -hmm. uh, severities. It can be very mild. It can be fixed with meds or maybe a little bit of behavioral therapy, but it can be very severe, which is something that we don't talk about. And if you look at ADHD, it's probably the lowest rung of the neurodiversity ladder in the sense that people always make fun of ADHDers with a common um, reference to a movie quote of saying, look, a squirrel, <laughs> you know, uh, given the fact that we're distracted easily or blame us for using ADHD as a reason for being lazy. But uh, we don't talk about chronic unemployment substance abuse, mood swings, you know, problems in relationships, they don't seem like superpowers to me. So which is, which is the 
reason why I don't really like using that word because it sort of subdues the the extremities of the condition. I, I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, downplay anybody who thinks it is. Like, I, I totally get it. Uh, I just feel like we need to stop romanticizing it as much and bring around the critical awareness that this condition needs. Yeah, right, yeah. Sorry for that I moment. haven't heard anybody else say that. Mary Moore really talks about the effects of ADHD, and I believe she was just recently diagnosed as being on the spectrum with mm -hmm. ASC, autism mm -hmm. spectrum mm -hmm. disorder. So, like you said, there are other things that accompany ADHD also, like with you, with mild dyslexia, mm -hmm. and um, how do you how do you work with um, dyslexia. See, I have no knowledge of dyslexia other than it's just letters backwards, out of place. Um, how does it affect your work, dyslexia, in addition to ADHD? Does it make things harder or is it just something you've always dealt with? Yeah, it actually makes things worse if I have to go through long walls of text. If you work in accessibility, yeah. you will know, though, one thing that we have to pour through is the web web content accessibility guidelines not the easiest to read and i i just don't even read that anymore so what i do is uh i'm a visual learner so i use videos with captions so captions benefit everybody you know not just people who are deaf or hard of hearing um that being said uh, i've had this problem throughout like even back when i was growing up where because I would get distracted so easily, I couldn't really finish reading what I was reading. And I would just skim words and try to fill in the gaps with what I thought made sense. So by the time I reached the end of the page, I realized either it was I interpreted it completely wrong or I didn't understand anything on the page. So when I see an article that says like on Medium or something that says reading time three minutes, I find that I'm like, you're dictating my reading pace. You know, when I see that, because uh, I could, it could take me 10 minutes. Uh, so, yeah, sorry to go around that roundabout answer, but it actually ADHD makes it worse because I yeah. you know, find it difficult to concentrate on the letters as it is. But thankfully, you know, technology today, uh, there's so much that I can do to overcome. I use something called the Beeline Reader. I don't know if anybody in the comments or whoever's listening uh, have used it. It's a Chrome extension, which sort of allows you to have like a, a highlight just on the current sentence that you're reading. And that makes a, a hell of a difference. Oh, it's the Beeline Reader? How do yeah. you... B-E-E-L-I-N-E. -E -E and it's a Chrome extension? Okay. Yeah, I think they got an extension. I'll put that in the comments on LinkedIn. Oh, for uh, some reason, I can't post in comments on LinkedIn for some reason. I'm not sure why, but... Um, it's called Beeline Reader. Beeline, okay. Beeline Reader in Chrome extension. Yeah. Okay, so now I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I, I don't know. I haven't. I think I had ADD. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what the difference is. I'm not is. making fun of yeah. that at all because I oh, do. No, no. Because it happens all the time. I don't know if it's because I, since I lived with my mother, who forgets things all the time, but she mm -hmm. kind of rubbed off on me, I have to say. <laughs> I love my mother dearly, don't get me wrong. But <laughs> sometimes it just forgets things randomly. So, um, okay, so someone says, um, my biggest idiot's strength is finding solutions quickly. To get job skill. Do you think that does that apply to you also? I know I that yeah. when you're doing something you enjoy, you hyper focus. Yeah. I would say that's Steph. I, I agree with you. I'd say that's probably my biggest skill. Where you you know you have like a a complex problem that other people sort of can't see. Give it to me. 
give me enough time to think and I'll come back with solutions. That's that's yeah. kind of like my biggest, like strongest skill set, I would say. So yes. Yeah, yeah that's very good. good. I would say that was that's a good skill to have. So um Krista says if you coach with me, I teach multiple revenue streams, so you have more stable income, referring to your, yeah, when you're starting out or you're very new and as an entrepreneur, you have unstable income, but then later, but so she really teaches that, so that's true, Krista, yeah, and then someone says, Stephanie, I have many kryptonites, even LinkedIn, <laughs> I'll get in the rabbit hole. I do too, Stephanie, that is yeah. so true. Well, social <laughs> media is, is kryptonite <laughs> for anybody with ADHD. Uh, like, yes. that's, my doctors always told me to like reduce screen time, but it's kind of impossible today, you know? Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be really... But that, I think that applies to anybody. Everyone, yeah, yeah. It's very addictive. And um, not in some not so good ways. <laughs> <laughs> so Krista has, a, um, let me see. She has a question for you. She wants to know if you have any book recommendations for ADHD. Um, it depends what kind of books, but I, uh, someone who I've read is um, Russell Barkley. He he's like the guy who talks about eighty. I think he was the guy who first did his um, uh, research on ADHD. Like he has a lot, but it's, it's a little bit more on uh, the scientific aspect of ADHD with his research. And I do think he's a, a rep for one of the big pharma companies, um, but, but it's very insightful. Oh, okay. Yeah it's very insightful. He has a lot of statistics on how meds help people or not. And, um, I, I found that good. I'm not sure if that's kind of like what you're interested in Krista, but, um, adult ADHD, there are a lot of podcasts. I can't remember the name right now, but it's by two ladies who have, um, discovered like their ADHD as adults. And then they talk about how they cope with it in the workplace and at home and stuff like that. I thought that was a pretty cool one, uh, considering women don't get diagnosed as as kids, right? Um, with, because you associate the hyperactivity being associated more with boys. And so this sort of like goes unnoticed, but not saying that they can't have it, but what research has shown is that women usually have the inattentive type where you can't see it but whereas the male counterparts have a lot of hyperactive uh symptoms so that's why you can like easily like see it and associate it so i have a combined type so i was diagnosed with you know you have hyperactive inattentive and combined like i have the combined type so I display like conditions of both yeah that's really interesting so there are different types of adhd in inattentive this is the combined type, which is yeah. the hyperactivity. What was the other one? Uh, inattentive. Inattentive and hyper. Yeah. Well, okay. So that is Russell Barkley, right? I'm trying to see where I Russell can Barkley. Barkley? Barkley. Barkley. B A R K L E Y. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to see how I can um, put that. I don't okay. even know how to do that yet. Whoop! I need to learn how to um, add, use a ticker. Like with this uh, Okay. Let's see if that works. Let me see if that works. Yeah, I don't have access to the chat or it could I could put it in there. Okay, you could put it in LinkedIn chat. Everybody would see it there. Um okay. I, I guess I have to open LinkedIn for that. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, there you oh, go. See, you it's it. in the ticker. <laughs> you got it. You got it. There you go. 
I think that's easier than me trying to go on LinkedIn or I'll, I'll get distracted and never yeah. come back to the show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm just kidding. So, um, let me just hide this. So, okay, I think someone is asking you, did your parents ever tell you that you did not have ADHD? Great question. Cultural acceptance, yes. Um, so I'm South Asian, um, my parents are from India. Uh, funnily enough, I got diagnosed with ADHD when I was a kid and they prescribed Ritalin, uh, but my parents were like, oh no, you don't, you know, as a cultural thing, like you don't take meds, you just study harder. So I had like um, after school, like extra study sessions, which didn't help. Uh, but yeah, it's, I, I didn't do well in school. I just like, I will just about like average, I'd say at average. Um, I, the only reason I got through it was through brute force. I, I think that's the only only explanation that I have. But yes, my parents uh, pretty much told me I didn't have it. And try harder. That's something that I think a yeah. lot of neurodivergent kids probably had to hear um, throughout their life. Yeah. Okay, I'm checking to see if there's any more questions. Did you know? Oh. I definitely I messaged him and he'll say he has to get to work. I don't know what that's about, but I'm assuming that's Stephanie. <laughs> we have to figure out how to get your name to show up, Stephanie. So um feel free to message me or Addy about how to get your name to show up. Okay, so Addy, back to my question before I got distracted again. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think we can encourage and support employers to hire more people who are neurodivergent? Right. So, I mean, we know being neurodivergent means that somebody is not going to process the information the same way as a neurotypical person would. So that means how they think or approach a problem will also deviate from the norm. This sort of divergent thinking is beneficial for the workplace to bring in creativity and problem solving skills. And if we can highlight this to employers, we can, you know, definitely make a case for hiring more neurodivergent um, workforce. Now, having said this, when you go into making a case for anything, you've got to have a, a clear plan and show the benefits and the outcomes, right? So I always say, the number one advantage anybody would have by hiring a neurodiverse workforce is the competitive advantage. Um, we've all like experienced at some point how considering broad perspectives from different cultures and socioeconomic backgrounds is advantageous to you know our workplace. So the same uh, competitive advantage extends to having a neurodiverse workforce, right? the way of thinking is different and just brings a different perspective that uh, see a homogenous work culture may fail to succeed. Like if everybody was thinking the same way, you're never going to actually solve a problem that could be looked at from a different, a different way. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like the more we're inclusive, of people who are neurodivergent and have, and people who have disabilities, I think it makes for a much better workplace. And then, and that way, if you have an inclusive um, workplace, you will have a much better understanding of how the world is, because you're a lot more inclusive and you're seeing yourself. Yeah, I mean, there are, again, the biggest problem lies with lack of awareness. So if people in the workplace, managers, employees, you know, coworkers were made aware of the superpowers, you know, that different yeah. people with neurodiversity or neurodiverse traits have, um, all the better. Like, for example, ADHD, right? Like hyper focus. We've talked about this, a recurring theme in this in this talk as well. So it allows you to just 
literally hyper focus on a task until it's completed. And I would say like, I always have a point to prove, like I'm never content with the work that I do. So I'm always trying to, you know, get the best work done. And that makes me good at solving other people's problems. So again, another case for hiring ADHDers at work. And then if you look at maybe um, people on the spectrum, the ASD, right? They're really good at grasping complex details and, and have uh, strong problem solving skills. So we know that like uh, there are a lot of autistic people who work in tech and thrive there. Um, dyslexia, well, these are all coping mechanisms, right? So while people with dyslexia can't really focus on reading the text, they perceive visual information. Maybe that's why um, I'm a visual learner as well. So there are a lot of engineers and architects who are who have dyslexia. Mm -hmm. So if we are able to identify where people can thrive and create that work inclusive workplace, like you said, those companies are going places. Right, right. Now I have a cousin, you know, back to what you were saying about the families, the question about being diagnosed and whether it's accepted by your parents based on, on the culture. Um, my cousin and is on the spectrum himself, and but his parents have never said anything to us, never say, but it's so obvious that he is on the spectrum. And he's always worked in tech. He still works in tech. He worked for Northrop Grumman. And now he works for some tech company. He moved far away from his parents. I don't know what that says, but yeah, he has his own family. But um, his parents did not, never said, he probably has never had a diagnosis, which is very, it makes, it makes me sad for him because um, it's obviously they don't accept it, whatever. They know he's different, different. But um, he's definitely on the spectrum, but he's never talked about it. His parents have never talked about it. And I'm sure that still happens, you know. There's not a lot of shame attached yeah. to it, probably. Maybe the parents blame themselves. So, yeah. so um, that makes me really sad for him. But um, she's doing very well. Yeah. Um, living in Pennsylvania with his wife and his dog. So um, I'm happy for him. And he's such a great guy. We're really close. So I am happy for him. So she's found ways to cope yeah. on his own somehow. So, so you know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that he has to go through that. It, it's shame is a, is a big part of this yeah. because of external factors. Um, and I don't think anybody wants to do it intentionally, right? It's just a lack of awareness. Right, right. Well, but, funny yeah. thing is, well, funny thing is, his mother is a doctor. She's a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. um, both highly educated parents, but I, obviously that doesn't mean a thing. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to your own family, you want everything to be perfect, I guess. So. Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, that's a tough one. But he's doing great, so I'm happy to say that he's doing really well. So somebody has great another question for you. Somebody has another question for you. Um, I think other people's work. I also have depression, anxiety, maybe bipolar, maybe OCD. That's quite a lot to cope with. Um, so I know that you have inattentive and hyper. Do you also have depression and anxiety due to having ADHD? Um, no, I don't think so. I not that I've been diagnosed with. I mean, it's just the general like anxiety with the hustle culture and the environment that we live in to just sort of perform at, at 110. But um, I'll 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 comment on on that comment and then. Uh, Krista had a really good question that I actually wanted to to talk about after, but um, I don't know, was that Stephanie maybe? Um, yeah, so taking on too much and other people's work, that is something that's very common and something we have to draw our boundaries around because 
when you are recognized at work as that super efficient person, they're going to start demanding too much of you. So it's critical to have those boundaries and not and prevent burnout. Um, that is something only an individual can sort of recognize and draw like what their limits are. But I think that's something that's a very, very important thing. Um, I know because I'm, uh, I'm recognized at, at work as someone who gets a lot of things done really fast. It's just dump all this extra work on me. Uh, and yeah, multiple times where I was on the edge of burning out, but yeah, sort of like setting those boundaries and helping myself be self-aware and pull myself back sort of helped. But not a lot of people have that amount of like self-awareness at work. And that's very dangerous. So yeah. neurotypicals, if you're trying to take advantage of ADHRs, please don't. Yeah. Let that be a message to you, employers. So take advantage of your workers. Yes, definitely. ADHD kind of hyper-focus, yes. Yeah, can okay. you pull up Krista's um, question, please? I saw it. Um, question. Okay. Saw it fly by somewhere. Oh, did I miss it? Oh, yes. Not to hire somebody in your diversity. What should I not do? Yeah. Any tips for managers? I love this question. Krista is very aware. Of, she, um, she's always. Um, wanted to learn new things about people. So when I started talking with her, she was very interested and that's what makes her a great coach. So that's a great question. And so. Yeah, great question. So managers, right? I think they form the, the crux because they're the ones who are directly managing somebody with neuro, uh, neurodivergent traits or they're the ones writing the uh, the job description even for uh, recruiters to hire. And many people blame the recruiters, but I think it all revolves around the, the manager as well. When it comes to providing accommodations, how they handle somebody with neurodivergent traits. Um, so some things uh, I would suggest is not to overload anybody with eight hours of work. Like people with neurodivergent traits require time to recharge to get their best work right and it may not happen in eight hour stretch like regular people or neurotypicals uh, like to work under so we'll work for two hours take a break for an hour and come back so flexible work timings is very important um managers set expectations meetings i would say meetings are very critical so you want to make them as short as possible, no more than 20 minutes, um, <clears throat> because the longer it goes, people with neurodivergence, it doesn't just have to be ADHD, but they might lose focus and people tend to forget things a lot. So we need everything in writing. That's another thing. Um, something else that I wanted to mention. I'm sorry, blank. But yeah, those are some of the things so micro breaks, yeah. split the work day, um, split up bigger tasks as well. So let's say you have a two week sprint, you might even benefit from breaking down into, you know, biweekly goals for somebody with neurodivergent, neurodivergent traits. Um, yeah, sorry, if anybody can think of something else you put in the chat, I'm blanking out right now. I think that's just some great recommendations. Um, I think that's a great start. Is, is that helpful to you, Krista? Let us know. Setting boundaries is very important. Um, a manager has to learn how to set boundaries for their workers, right? To, or the other way around. Or the, or the worker with ADHD has to show them how to set the boundaries or you have to do it yourself. You kind of have to be an advocate for yourself in the workplace, yeah. just like other people with disabilities like me. When I had to, when we had meetings, 
I was always the only deaf person in the in the company. So when I had request a sign language interpreter for a meeting, um, I um, almost never got one. I probably should have threatened them with the lawsuit or something. Maybe that would have lit the fire under them. Who knows? <laughs> well, if if, if you gotta go that distance, then it's probably not a good place to work to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had I always had a hard time finding a full time job. This is why I don't work in the workplace anymore. Mm. I'm better off just working with me, myself, and I. So, <laughs> so, um, let's see. Let me see. Then Stephanie says, sometimes psychiatrists overdiagnose too. Um, I don't know what that means. What would that, what would it, an example of overdiagnosis be? Um, maybe with different core mor comorbidities, you know, that, mm -hmm. that have similar looking traits. That's why it's very important to find that right doctor, you know, who's a specialist. Uh, and also, I don't, I don't know where most of the users are from, if they're from the US, like um, I got my diagnosis in the US, I'm in Canada now, but mm -hmm. you could just do like an informal thing for like in one session, like $200 or something like that. And that when they recommend the bigger, more comprehensive cognitive, executive cognitive functioning tests that could go all the way up to like three or four grand. That's where people sort of don't want to pay that, but that's very important to actually figure out where the problems are coming from. That's such an important step that you shouldn't skip. And I think that's where the problem of overdiagnosis comes. I don't know. It's just my thought. I'm not really sure if that's accurate or not. I went through the whole thing. So I did, I did a whole bunch of tests, um, for cognitive function, um, attention disorder and, uh, self-evaluation questionnaires by myself and my family, people who know me best so they can actually report my behavioral traits. Right. Um, so using all this information, they then come to a conclusion that, yeah, he's got a combined type. But that, that's just my um, understanding as to why overdiagnosis exists. If you don't do that, go the proper yeah. route. Right. You should do probably more thorough testing. Um, that's probably something yes. that should be incorporated more. Um, definitely wanted to know. I'm a visual learner also. Do you think the B-line reader helps? because it's a visual cue. I yeah. think you did mention that. Yep. yep. So what it does is if you're, if you're scrolling through a website, um, it kind of looks like a, like a ruler and it just highlights one line at a time. And as you scroll down, it, it shifts the focus onto oh, each. Okay. Line. Um, so that's why I like captions as well on videos because right. it really helps me retain the information as it's being spoken. Like a lot of people say, oh, if you have dyslexia, try audiobooks." But I can't with my ADHD because I'm, I'm always distracted. So I just forget, like yeah. I'm lost in my own thoughts when I'm listening to a podcast and I gotta always rewind and listen to it. So it's the same deal with reading text, but visual probably works best for me. So I would say this, if you met one neurodivergent person, you've met one neurodivergent person. Everybody's completely different. They have different behavioral traits, coping mechanisms. So a one size doesn't fit all. Right, exactly. Okay, so that brings me to my next question. What is the biggest challenge as a business owner in getting companies to understand that accessibility means good business? My view is that they like to see the return on their investment. What is your take on this? Yeah, so I talked to a lot of C-suite executives to sell accessibility, right? And the biggest complaint that I hear is a lack of a budget. 
they're always like, I don't have the money to pay for this. Amongst other things, but that's something that's the most common I hear. So when the conversation goes that route, I always come in and I'm very clear with the benefits, right? Walking in with a clear plan of what the problem is, how I'm going to solve it or how my company is going to solve it and what the outcome will be. Now, a favorable outcome um, is something that mitigates risk. And, and when you talk about accessibility, that could be likely legal, right? You don't want to get sued. Then the second thing could be reducing cost. You do this by what we call shift left by incorporating accessibility into the design phase or as, or as early as possible. By doing this, there have been studies that show that you reduce risk. And the third thing would be increased profits by having a wider customer base. So if you, if your argument demonstrate any one of these three points, it's critical to demonstrate ROI and why a business uh, and a business need around it. So yes, I will, I will say yes to your question that they like to see ROI and this is how I would go about explaining it to them and making that like very strong business case for accessibility. Sorry, I think I was rambling on for too long. No, <laughs> I kind no. of forgot what I was, uh, <laughs> no. I was in the flow. <laughs> now you're pointing out three things. One is, oh shoot, I would have to go back. But you're pointing out three things that are important in showing people who want to know employers who want to incorporate accessibility. I don't think you're going to meet uh, anybody who's going to say, well, I don't want to do this. They may have their reasons, but um, they, like you say, they, do, they think it'll be expensive, time consuming, um, just too hard to incorporate. But um, it really can be sim simplified if they work with the right people, accessibility professionals, experts, and people who work on the back end, um, people in marketing. See, I'm only focusing on accessibility and marketing, which is not the technical side, because I'll leave that up to other people like you. So, um, but there's a huge need for content and accessibility in, right. in, in marketing, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have infographics that companies love to share or mm -hmm. promo videos, but if they're not accessible, you're missing out on, on the reach, right? Right. Um, so exactly. there's a big scope there. Accessibility is not just technical. And I think that's where the common misconception is. Like it's it makes yeah. a big part of any business department. Right, exactly. Um, Stephanie says, works well with highly non ADHD people as they help balance me out. And we tend to make great teams with different skills working together. I'm going to be too fast. The teammate can reality check me. Great point. But I would say a caveat there is they have to understand that you have ADHD and what your behavioral traits that you put out. Because when somebody doesn't understand, sometimes I've been told I'm, I can be aggressive, but it's just me trying to like move fast. But uh, the example that Stephanie gave, uh, my partner understands me now. So I get a good reality check from her and I think we work well there for that balance, but it's critical that somebody actually understands and not misinterpret that for something else, those traits. But yeah, great point. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're coming up on an hour of Daddy and it's just so much insight and information with us about ADHD and how we can work with people with ADHD and other neurodivergent traits 
Um, do you have anything, any last thing, any last words to say before we sign off? Uh, no, it's, it's been a pleasure. I mean, I could talk about ADHD and lived experience forever. <laughs> and I think we need more people to talk about their lived experience to put out that um, yeah. their authentic self, right? Because that's when our coworkers and people around us will be families as well understand what actually the the true severity of the condition is and not downplay it um so yeah i would love to you know talk about this more if anybody wants to wow. have any questions or would like to talk about this further let's connect yeah yes connect with Addy and dm him with any questions you have, um, especially you could say if you have any questions for Addy, I think you both should connect anyway. So yes. that would be great. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning, this afternoon, evening, wherever you are. And um, join me next week where I'll talk with Cam Bodoin also about accessibility and what he does, the work that he does. So um, okay. thank you everybody. Okay. Now I would. Thank you, Addy, for being here. Thanks, Thank you. Juana. And I'll see you next week. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.